IT to save. Thank you so much, Pastor, and all the best. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. There you have it, viewers. It is. It promises to be lovely. You can't afford to miss it. Continue to stay tuned in. Remember to go on Facebook to check out our stream schedule and share it with a friend. And where possible, come and join us here at Camp Meeting and Play Institute 2018 under the theme, A Taste of Pentecost. There's one other thing that I'm inviting all those who are viewing on Facebook to do today. Let us know what is your favorite camp meeting experience. We want to hear from you. So be sure to post that on our website I now turn over to the praise team as they take us through this morning's morning manner devotion with Pastor Kenwell Campbell. people say amen we will invite you at this time just to find a prayer partner turn the person closest to you hold onto that person's hand and for a minute each we will pray that truly Pentecost will be experienced not by just some of us but by all of us afresh this morning we're going to blend our voices as we sing prayerfully Hoover o'er me, Holy Spirit, bathe my trembling hearts and brow. Fill me with thy hallowed presence. Come, oh come, and fill me now. This is also an opportunity to at least get to know somebody. Call the person by name. So get the, make sure that you, you will get to know the person's name so that when you pray, when you intercede on behalf of that person, you can call the person's name. Hoover o'er me. Holy Spirit.
stand as we finish on the throne of grace. We're going to ask that you all stand and bow your heads reverently as I speak to our maker and our king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Loving, lovely Lord. Holy, holy, holy and righteous thou art. You are the sovereign Lord of this vast universe. You are the creator and sustainer of life. We give you thanks and praise, a loving, lovely Lord, for the multitude of things that you have done for us. From the day we were conceived in our mother's womb until this very moment, you are providing for us, and we give you thanks, O oh Lord. Loving Father, we are here at Camp Verley. You have brought us here, loving, lovely Lord, for a taste of Pentecost. And so I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that all of us here will keep our eyes on you. I pray that our thoughts will focus on you and nothing else. I rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus, for he will want to zoom things into our thoughts. But, oh, loving, lovely Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will possess us here today and help us to understand that we are on holy ground. Loving Lord, we want to understand, we want us to have a close relationship with you, Father. And I pray, oh Lord, that we will surrender our will to your will and let your will be done in our lives. We want it to be noise abroad, just like on the day of Pentecost, Heavenly Father, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon those disciples that were there. They went forward with power and with clarity. And so I pray that when we leave Camp Verley, loving, lovely Lord, we will not leave the same we came. We will be on fire for you, loving Father. Lord, I want to present all campers today. As they are here, Father, I pray that they will not stay in their cabin and have their own conversation here, there, and everywhere, but they will come into the sanctuary here to receive the blessings that you have in store. Lord, you have laid your hand on a man's servant to speak to us. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will let your Holy Spirit possess him so that he can speak with clarity, so that he can speak with authority, so that your words will go forth with power and authority. And I pray, Lord, that as he speak, we who will be sitting and listening, Lord, the words will enter into our hearts and our lives will be changed. Have your own sweet way, Lord, as we come to the worship we pray in Jesus' most holy precious name. You may be seated. This morning we we're happy for the ministry of the one whom will share God's word with us this morning. Pastor Kenroy Campbell is a son of the soil. Amen. He was born in the parish of Manchester in, in a little community nestled in, in the upper section of Manchester known as Pike. So he's a son of Central Jamaica Conference. He holds a first degree in religion and theology from Northern Caribbean University. He also holds a master's degree in religion from Trinity Theological Seminary, in the United States of America. Presently, Pastor Campbell serves as the senior pastor, as the district pastor for the Comfort Hall District of Churches, the district comprised of four churches. He is happily married to Raquel Nee Boswell. The union has produced one healthy baby girl. Amen. Pastor Campbell is a humble man of God. He is a preacher of righteousness. He is an evangelist. And I believe that the Lord, long before he was conceived in his mother's womb, the Lord would have ordained for him to be our devotional speaker this morning. And the Lord knew that you would have been here to hear a word from God. Won't you say amen? 
So I believe that nothing is, is an accident. Everything was ordained by God. So I challenge you this morning, don't allow anyone to distract you. I believe that God has prepared a special package with your name written all over it. Amen? So the songwriter says, let's forget about ourselves. Let us concentrate on him and worship him. But just before Pastor Campbell comes to us and share that very, very special message, we have someone who was also handpicked by God long before she was born to prepare our hearts for that message. I'm speaking of our beloved uh, sister from uh, the Cheesefield Church, Sister Trisha Gay Kelly. After her rendition, we will listen to a very special message from Pastor Campbell, God's mouthpiece, God's man servant for this time. Could you give Sister Trisha Gay and Pastor Campbell a big amen?
so, so glad that God did not throw the clay away. I am very happy to know that because of his grace and his mercies, this clay can be used as an instrument in his hands. Brothers and sisters, God is good. Amen? God is in indeed a wonderful Savior, Maker, and Lord. He put us to bed last night and he awoken us up this morning. He has brought us to church to worship. Amen? He's brought us to worship, to praise, because if there is any person that deserves praise, it is God. And I just came to this pulpit to praise God. Amen? I came to worship. I want to say thanks to the administrators along with Pastor McLean for the opportunity to share a word from God. My wife would have loved to be here, but due to work, she's unable to be here, but I know she is praying for me. I know that many persons are praying. Amen? If you have your Bibles with you. Go with me to the book of Acts, the second chapter. Acts, the second chapter. We will consider four verses beginning at verse 1. Are you there? When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, one sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. For the next few minutes, I will share with you on this topic, what's in Pentecost? What's in Pentecost, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Father, once again I stand, nothing in my hands I bring, but simple to the old rugged cross I claim. I pray that the sermon will not get in the way of the message, nor this preacher stand in the way of the cross. May your name be glorified. May heaven come down and glory fill our soul. For we ask it in Jesus' name. What's in a name in Pentecost? What's in Pentecost? Entering a relationship with Jesus, the disciples had all kind of expectations as they waited for the earthly kingdom. Their expectations centered around a life free of burdens and a life of tranquility. And expectations that all Jews had as they looked for the coming Messiah. The burdens weighed out by the mighty Romans became the load that was carried by all Jews. The prophecies dished out by the Old Testament concerning the Messiah would have been read with intense spur and hope by the people. Now, few people recognize Jesus as the anointed one the Messiah. 
following Jesus around, the disciples and others have witnessed the astonishing miracles and signs that came from his voice, his hands, and his feet. They saw the hands of Jesus bringing blindness to sight, his voice speaking words that caused the storm to cease and the devil to flee, his feet walking not just on solid ground, but on the wetness of the sea. These signs and miracles would have heightened their expectations to a level second to none. They spent times arguing and debating about who will sit close to Jesus on his throne. Their pride stood taller and their hospitality decreased as they walked past Gentiles, outcasts, Samaritans, and others. Nevertheless, three and a half years in the company of the, of the expected king of Rome, they are told in a language written not by hand, but by an experience up out on a hill called Calvary. There where Jesus was scolded, spot on, nailed to a wooden cross, and died in shame according to the Jews. This language was not understood by the disciples. They have fled the scene in terror. Their hopes and desires have fallen. Their minds are confused and their hearts are entangled with the past over lamb having been slain. But, but just as they were about to write off the crucified Savior as a defeat, just as they were about to write off the fact that there is no hope for tomorrow, just as they were about to give up throwing the towel, Jesus arose and appeared to them in dazzling clothes. Their faith stood tall again. Their hope mounted up and their heads were made steady. Now they fully understand that the Messiah had to die, raise and ascend the day. Recognize that the kingdom of Jesus is not a of this world that their place of abode is in a new heaven and a new earth on the mount of Olivet they witness their master ascended to paradise with these words finding lodgment in their hearts and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and you shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judah, in Samaria, and to the end of the world. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. Verse, oh brothers and sisters, before you can have penetration of Pentecost, you got to have preparation for Pentecost. Acts chapter 1 verses 12 and 14 tell us that the disciples returned to Jerusalem. They went in a place called the upper room. They remained steadfast in prayer. Luke, the author of Acts, used the present participle here to describe that they were not just in power, but that was a state of their lives. They were constant in prayer. Their first work was prayer and devotion to God. They stopped to pray. They stop to connect with their maker. Stop to open their hearts to their creator. Stop to confess their sins to their savior. Stop to listen to God. Yes, saints of God, they stop to have a little talk with Jesus. For somebody says just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. He's the only voice that released my troubled mind. I hear Ellen White says prayer is the opening of the heart to God as a friend. The first step in Pentecost is devotion to God. We are called to devotion. We are called to prayer. We are called to stay a little longer on our knees. Prayer is still the lifeblood of the church. 
Uh, is a bridge that connects us with Jesus. Uh, when everyone else fails to listen to you, uh, turn their backs on you, uh, cast you aside, ostracize you. Uh, oh, brothers and sisters, there is a God uh, who will never do that to you. Uh, a God who answers. Uh, it doesn't matter the time you call. Uh, he will always help. Well, when everyone else uh, turn, guess what? When your midnight hours turn to nightmare, uh, uh, flowing tears masking across uh, your pillow purr captures the ears of God. Uh, because when God hears a penitent sinner, uh, a praise, a uh, prayer, uh, brothers and sisters, God uh, ain't too busy to stop and listen. A uh, uh, prayer speak loudly to God. Purr awakens the hands of God. Purr moves the will of God. Purr opens the floodgates of divine revelation from God. The disciples were fervent in prayer. But notice with the preacher. Notice with the preacher that the disciples were not talking about Peter's denial. You're not with me. I said the disciples were not talking about Peter's denial. They were not talking about James and John wanting to sit on Jesus' side. They weren't talking about how did Thomas doubt Jesus. They weren't talking about Peter having lied three times that he never knew him. Brothers and sisters, they were talking about the cross. He was wounded for transgression, uh, a bruise for iniquities. Uh, the chastisement of our peace uh, was upon him and with his tribes. We are healed. Yes, they were talking uh, how he was crucified. Uh, brothers and sisters, if you go back 2,000 years ago uh, and just stop on Friday, if you see Jesus on Friday, he's insulted, spot on, and afflicted. Uh, on Friday, he's battered and bruised. Uh, on Friday, he's mocked and jeered, uh, slapped and scorned. Uh, on Friday, they hang him high uh, and stretch him wide. Uh, on Friday, uh, on Friday, he's mocked and jeered. On Friday, he's crucified and in a tomb. But if Friday was bad, Sabbath was worse. Because on Sabbath, he, on Sabbath, he's, on Sabbath, he's defeated. He, on Sabbath, brothers and sisters, he's victimized. His enemies prevail. He has been conquered. On Sabbath, it looked like deception had defeated him. It looked like eternity had terrorized him. And death had denied him. And dominion had demolished him. And the devil had the power to destroy him. On Sabbath, it looked like hell had the power to hold him and the grave had the lock to keep him but I'm so glad that when I'm so glad that when Friday is bad and Sabbath is worse another day is coming because all Sunday morning he was revived and resurrected he was alive and he was elevated and exalted. He was magnified, dignified, and glorified. On Sunday, he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. On Sunday, he rescued a perishing, care for the dying. On Sunday, he was in search of me. On Sunday, he was in search of you. He came up with the keys of hell and the keys of heaven. I'm so glad that the there is a place called Calvary because there was where he was nailed. As somebody says, death backed up Jesus to Calvary. A death fell in the arms of Jesus. A death stopped the heart of Jesus. A death held the hands of Jesus. But praise God, a death couldn't plug the ears of Jesus because early Sunday morning, he got up. Oh, I'm so glad on Sunday he's a savior of Adam's race, Adam's fallen race. The disciples had Christ on their mind. Listen to this preacher and listen well. 
how many times we are found tearing down our brothers and our sisters when we should be praying for them. Found always seeing the negatives of the church rather than being the solution to the problems. We are found being the investigator rather than the initiator. We investigate the problems but never initiate the solution. We talk how bad the problems are but never pray seriously to God about them. Some of us even have the audacity to act like we are the watchmen on Zion's wall. We always see the movement of the devil but we never see how the devil use us to tear down God's church. Uh, can I talk to somebody like Saul? We think we are doing God's will. Uh, persecuting the brethren with our words and our attitude. Uh, but I'll stop by to tell you, Paul says, uh, let your conversation be always uh, full of grace. Uh, we are called to prior uh, not to tear down uh, our brothers and our sisters. Uh, if we are preparing for Pentecost, uh, we got to get to the altar. We got to get to a place where all we need is Jesus. We got to get to a place where self is lost. Where our own self interest is forgotten. And Jesus is placed in the center. If we are going to get to Pentecost. Can I talk to somebody? I hear Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, Dead and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat of its fruits. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one accord. The Greek word for accord is the word omos, which can mean one intent, one purpose. You see, you can be in one place, one system, and not in one accord. One place with different mindset. One place geographically but divided spiritually. Can I tell you, go, go with me into the Bible. Judas was with the disciples, walk in the company of Jesus. But his eyes were fixed on 30 pieces of silver. And his heart was trumping, was trumpeting the camp of the devil. Achan, Achan helped to destroy the city of Jericho. But his very hands were against God's will. King Saul fought for Israel. But his soul made peace with the devil. Saul in the New Testament testament thought he was with God spiritually but recognized his actions were testimonies against God. Satan was in the presence of God walking in heavenly places but his will and desires were to overthrow God. Friends you can be in church clapping and dancing singing and praising but that doesn't mean you are one with the spirit. We get it right sometimes. Uh, we believe that activity in church uh, mean that you're a child of God. Uh, we believe that just because uh, we have been serving for 10, 15, or 20, 20 or 40 or 50 years uh, it means that our ticket uh, is in glory. i stop by to tell you uh, activity uh, does not define uh, your relationship uh, because many get active to be seen. Uh, many get active uh, so that somebody can point him or her out. But I'm so glad that when the, when the sinner comes boldly to the throne of grace and say, Lord, it's not my mother, it's not my father, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I hear Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am undone. My tongue is unclean. I hear, I said I hear David says, have mercy, 
have mercy on me according to your loving kindness creating me a clean heart what the saints of God need is a heart transplant and a mind regulator brothers and sisters what we need is to know Jesus Paul says in Romans 12 I beseech you therefore brethren that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy holy and acceptable unto God the word holy simply means to be set apart the truth is many of us have set ourselves apart but Paul says it got to be accepted by God and be not conformed to this world but be he trans oh Oh Lord, prepare, prepare me for Pentecost. Prepare me for Pentecost. I need a Pentecost. Because after you have preparation for Pentecost, it's time for penetration of Pentecost. You see, Pentecost, from the Greek word Pentecostos, simply means the 50th. It is known in the Old Testament as the Feast of Weeks or the Shavuot. It is also known in the Old Testament, Numbers 28, 20, verse 26, and Exodus 33, 23, rather, verse 16, as the first fruits. This was a day that the first fruits of the wheat harvest was presented to God. Pentecost. Is a celebration and thanksgiving to God for the harvest which begins at Passover. At this event, the Israelites would wave an offering of the first fruits to God in thanking Him for the full harvest. Pentecost occurs just 50 days after Passover. The disciples on this day were offering their hearts to God. Their offering was not wheat, barley, or sheep, but their surrendered heart to God. Oh, while they were giving their gifts, it was their heart. The Bible says a mighty rushing wind. The Spirit came down like a mighty rushing wind, like a violent rushing wind. We are reminded in Ezekiel 37 when God asks Ezekiel if the dry bones can live. Ezekiel said, Lord, you know. God told Ezekiel, just prophesy again. It's on verse 7 of, of, uh, verse seven of Ezekiel 37 says that there was a noise. And suddenly a rattling and the bones came together. You see the disciples, they felt bad about how they live with Jesus for the three and a half years. But they were in power because they have seen the evidence. But the spirit came down like a mighty rushing wind and lit up the place. They were now filled with the spirit. Can I talk to somebody that God wants to pour down upon us? But if you allow me to push on and, and to come to where it says divided tongues sought upon them. The word, the word translates as divided is the Greek word. Is the Greek word. The word translated, translated as, as divided tongues is the Greek word diamerizo. The word diameter comes from that word. It simply means, it carries a sense in this text of giving gifts or gifts given out from one common source. Somebody missed that. The same source. It means that I don't need to covet you of your gifts because we all receive gifts from the same source tailored and cut for each person. 
Pentecost brothers and sisters understand when you covet you belittle your gifts when you pay less attention to the gifts God given to you just because you want to preach like somebody else speak like somebody else prophesy like somebody else you lose the trueness of your gift brothers and sisters we don't need to covet we need to say Lord whatever gift if you give me, I'm going to do the work of God because gifts ain't about you. Gifts ain't about me. It is about him. Oh, you don't need a college degree to receive this gift. No work experience is needed. No interview is needed. No resume is needed. No recommendation is needed. No backdoor deal is needed. You don't need to know the conference president or the first elder. You just need to know Jesus. His sacrifice. Can I talk to somebody? If I know him, he has given me a gift. If I know him, I can tell somebody. I may not be able to preach like Paul, but I can tell somebody that he died for all. I may not be able to use the intellect like Socrates, but I can tell somebody that I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore sinking deep but praise God the master I said the master he came and lifted me it was not theology that lifted me it was not church office that lifted me it was the spirit oh I'm so glad but I just need the spirit. Your physical feature can't even qualify you. Money can't qualify you. Church office can't qualify you. A good name in the society can't qualify you. What qualifies you is your willingness and a surrendered heart. The by I hear the songwriter says, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I hear Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18 says, Come, let us reason. Though your sins be like scarlet, though it be red like crimson it shall be as wool I don't know about you but I need Jesus when I'm wrapped up tied up tangled up it doesn't matter what you say about me because the day I gave my life to God it was it is not me anymore Paul says I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but the but I live yet not I but Christ that live it so you're looking at me but it's not me it is Jesus in me brothers and sisters it is the power of God in me some of us want the power to rest on us but we don't want to submit to the power can I talk to somebody sometimes we even fight for power but this power you can't fight and get it it is not given to you a base on what you have but base on who Oh Lord, I need this power. So the disciples, the Bible says that they were all filled. Have mercy. How many? All filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, the word in Greek is plero, which which means that fulfilled, which means that that is that that which is to be filled is already empty you're not with the preacher that which is to be filled got to be empty oh lord empty me lord 
Brothers and sisters, you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You want a spirit, you want the spirit in you. Empty, you gotta empty yourself. Empty a bitterness and fault finding. Empty a power seeking and backstabbing. Empty of loss and laziness. Empty a pride and power seeking. Empty of grudge and, and grumble. Empty of ungratefulness and an un, uh, unconsecrated heart. Empty of hatred and heartless behavior. You can't be filled if malice is in you. You can't be filled if you are bitter. You can't be filled. The reason sometimes when we preach and sing why the church doesn't move is because we come to the pulpit already filled with something that is not God. But God says, preacher, you got to stop at Calvary and get a filled. You got to stop there. Oh, brothers and sisters, at the cross of the cross, where I first saw the light, brothers and sisters, we got to go back go back to the cross and see Jesus. He was wounded. Oh, take me back to the cross, Lord. On the cross of the cross was where I first saw the light. The burdens of my heart rose away. It was there by faith I received thy sight. We got to get back to the cross. We come filled with things and stuff that is not of God, but we want God to fill us. We come to the pulpit with a brother in our heart, but we want God's spirit. God says, I can't sit on a brother in your heart. I can't sit on a sister in your heart because I want to sit on that brother independent of you. I want to sit on that sister independent of you. You got to empty. Oh, oh Lord, empty me. I want to be filled with love and loyalty. Fill us, Lord, with patience and perseverance. Fill us with power, peace, and prowess. Fill us with Holy Ghost fire, fortitude, and firmness. Fill us with love, longevity, and loyalty. Fill us with a burden for souls. Fill me, Jesus. I won't let you go until you fill me. I won't walk away until you fill me. Because if I'm not filled... I can't proclaim Pentecost. If I'm not filled, I can't tell somebody I need a feeling. But this is where it gets messy. This is where it gets messy. Because the truth is, preparation for Pentecost is an individual experience. This is where it gets messy. Preparation for Pentecost is an individual experience. But Pentecost is not an individual experience. I know some, some person's antennas are up. But if you stay with the preacher, you're going to agree with me. I said preparation is an individual experience. But Pentecost is a communal experience. You, 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 the problem is we have been reading the text, but we never read the book. We read the verses, but we never read the entire book. Brothers and sisters, Pentecost cannot be experienced by one person alone. Pentecost is not for a church member it is for the church. You're not with me. Let me bring it out of the text. Luke says that the disciples were in one accord. In order to have Pentecost, the members of the church got to come together. No, no, no. Let me go to Ellen White to, to, for some help here. Testimonies, volume 8, page 20. She says, it was after the disciples 
had come into perfect unity when they were no longer striving for the highest place that the spirit was poured out. We are still driving. If the disciples never united, there would have been no Pentecost. Yes, the Holy Spirit would have come, but not in the measure and power he came. I know you're still lost. Let me get it to you. One person cannot house all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You're still not there yet. You're still not there yet. No one person can manifest all the spirits of God, all the, the gifts of God. Pentecost is not about the gift of tongues. Tongues is one of the gifts. Pentecost, a definition, as we take it from the, is a united church empowered by the Holy Spirit with all the gifts needed for mission. You're not with me. The reason tongues is emphasized in chapter 2 is because there were people who needed to hear the gospel in their own language. But because you stop in chapter 2, in chapter 2, the emphasis is on the gifts of tongues. In chapter 3, the emphasis is on the gift of healing. Oh, come here, come here, a certain man standing at the gate of beautiful. Oh, come here, Peter, Peter and John. And he was there. Peter said, look at us, a silver and gold have I none, but such as I have in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. God up. In chapter 4, the emphasis is on the gift of praying until something happens. In chapter 5, the emphasis is on the gifts of discernment and prophecy. And an eyes and Sapphira. In chapter 6, the emphasis is on the gifts of preaching and hospitality. In chapter 7, the emphasis is on faith and boldness in the face of evil. Can I talk to somebody? A Pentecost is for mission and it takes a gift the do mission can I talk to somebody Acts chapter 1 verse 8 but he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and he shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem hear what Jesus says in John chapter 17 and verse 3 Jesus prays to his father for the believers to be united so that the world may know in other words if there's no unity the world may never know that's why Pentecost is a united force wrapped up and tied up in the spirit of God as God manifests uh, uh, gifts in the church uh, so the mission can be carried out. So guess what? When people stand aside and segregate themselves from the body of Christ, from the church, they are saying, I ain't ready for the second coming. When you tear down the church, you are saying you ain't ready to go home. When you stand aside and lambas members and lambas brothers and lambas sisters, you are removing the spirit out of the church. The church of God got to get together, press together, because in the church is a hospital. And where there is a hospital, there are some wounded folks. So, brethren, I'm going to, I'm going to bring this to a close in my final teaching. When we are united and filled with the Holy Spirit, it is time for the promulgation of Pentecost. You're now with me. There is a dramatic shift in the text. In verse 2, the Bible says, 
that the spirit filled the house where they were sitting. But in verse 6, it says that the multitude was amazed when they heard the disciples speaking in their languages. I know you haven't gotten it. The spirit came in the upper room. But the manifestation of gifts is not for the upper room. You prayed hard in your closet. You fasted in your closet. But it's time to get in the street because the gifts are not for your closet. It is for lost souls out there. We got to get up and begin to proclaim the good news of salvation. Oh, the spirit power is not for your closet, but he shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and he shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in all Judah, and in Samaria. Brothers and sisters, it is easy to witness in Jerusalem. It is easy because Jerusalem is home. Almost everybody in the first century in Jerusalem was a Jew. Jerusalem is an easy place because you are witness uh, to you are witnessing to persons who are familiar with you uh, and you are familiar with them. It's easy to even witness in Judah because Jerusalem was a part of Judah. Yes, the influence, uh, the influence of the Greek culture may have caused a little difficulty, but it's still easy. But when you get to Samaria. We don't want to go to Samaria because Samaria is a dangerous place. Samaria at the time of Jesus was a place where persons who had intermarried with pagans, we have cut them off. The people were known as Samaritans. Samaritans were hostile to Jews. Jews were also hostile to Samaritans. In St. John chapter 4, the Bible says that Jews had no dealing with Samaritans. The Jews at the time of Jesus treated the Samaritans as dogs, outcasts, pagans, unclean, and inhuman. We are called to go to Samaria. Oh, we are called to go to Samaria. The question is, preacher, where is Samaria? Oh, Samaria is a place where no one wants to go, but God's people are there to be rescued. Oh, preacher, are you, what are you talking about? Where is Samaria? Samaria is a place that people are afraid to drive through. But God is saying you got to go there. Oh, where is Samaria? Samaria is a place where robbers, gunmen, drunkards, drug addicts, and homosexuals are there. But God said they are my people. you got to go to rescue them. Samaria is not a company comfortable place. It is not a place where you get tranquility. It is a place where it is only the mercy and the grace of God. But where he sends me, he says, I will lead you. Where you go, I'll be with you. I hear the psalm. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down. Oh, in green pastures, he restoreth my soul, leading me in the path of righteousness. But he also prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. We got to go to Samaria. But the big question is, have you ever been a Samaritan? You don't want to go to Samaria. But have you ever been a Samaritan? I have been a Samaritan. We all have been Samaritans because the Bible says we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. But thank God for the grace of God. But one day he lifts us up. I've got to go to Samaria. Jesus says in John 4, I must. 
I must uh, go through Samaria. I've got a plan for Samaria. There is a woman there. I've got a plan for her. We are called uh, to go to Samaria. We are called uh, to go with the gospel. We are called uh, to be equipped and ready uh, to march like soldiers. Uh, we are not called uh, to sit down in church uh, and take a bench. Uh, we are called uh, to tell somebody uh, that he lives. And so brethren, I'm going to take it to a close because the truth is Pentecost is the first fruit of the harvest Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse verses 13 to 14 that the Holy Spirit is our Araban our down payment our guarantee one day the full payment will be given. One day the whole harvest will be reaped. The question is, who is the reaper? Acts chapter 1 says, while the disciples were gazing into heaven, an angel came down, Pastor McLean, and say, he men of Galilee, why standing here, gazing into heaven, this same Jesus this same Jesus, uh, Paul picks it up uh, in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 and verse 16. Uh, for the Lord himself. You ask me the question, uh, who is the reaper? Paul At someone else's table, uh, sailing someone else's boat, uh, rode someone else's donkey, buried in someone else's tomb, uh, yet to him belong uh, all the unsearchable riches of glory. Uh, as an infant, uh, frightened the king, uh, as a boy, uh, confused the scholar, uh, as a man, uh, stunned the Pharisees, uh, as God, uh, he quiet the storm, uh, he's distinctive uh, in supernatural capacity. Uh, Super, superlative uh, in sovereign majesty. Uh, he's radiant uh, in eternal splendor. Uh, he's matchless uh, in his deity. Uh, he's exclusive uh, in his beauty. Uh, the one who wrote no books. But libraries can't contain uh, the books written in his name. Uh, the one who wrote no music, uh, but yet the noblest geniuses of melody uh, bring their talents uh, and laid it at his feet. Uh, the one who had no degree, uh, but mastered uh, all discipline uh, of studies. The one uh, who had uh, no medical degree, uh, but got a touch. Got a touch, but got a touch by a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years, but just one touch. Our brothers and sisters, just one touch. The one who had no visa, who has no visa, but will descend from heaven with a shout. Oh, he's a rose of Sharon. To them who have no love, he's the captain of Jehovah's host. To them who need protection, he's a priest bearing a sin offering. To all who have sin, the one who Herod couldn't kill, Satan couldn't seduce, sin couldn't stand, the roaring sea couldn't withstand, sinners couldn't resist, death couldn't destroy, and the grave could not hold him. Are you still with me? He's the beginning and the end, the architect of the universe. He always was, he always is, and he always will be, will be unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, undismayed. His word is right, his will is unchangeable, his ways is eternal. He's the ancient, 
He is the ancient of days. He is Adam's redeemer. He is Abraham's promise. He is Moses' bush on fire. He is Caleb's truth. He is Joshua's faith. He is Samson's strength. He is David's music. He is Solomon's wisdom. He is Jeremiah's Lord. He is Ezekiel's wheel. In the middle of the wheel, he is Hosea's marriage counselor. He is Malachi's last day. He is Matthew God with us. Mark's suffering servant. Luke love for the loss, John word made flesh, but over there on the Isle of Patmos, John says he's the Alpha, he's the Alpha, and he's the Omega. He is the beginning and he is the, he is the end, the first and the last. He is enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternally steadfast, immortally gracious. He is the greatest phenomenon that ever crossed the horizon of the globe. He is the supreme subject of all literature. He is the fundamental doctrine of all theology. He is God's son, the sinner's savior. The captive ransom, the bread of life, the sinner's piece of civilization. He stands in the solitude of himself. Oh, he's different and unique. He's unprecedented. He's unparalleled. He's unsurpassed, unshakable, unmoved, undefeated. Never lose a battle. He's a rock in a weary land. He's a bridge over troubled water. He's a shelter in the time of storm. He's a savior over sin. He's a leader over Satan and his evil tricks. He's our victor taking us home. He's Theanthropos. He's God man. He's the son of man on his mother's side, but the son of God on his father's side. He's the son of David on his mother's side. But the root of David on his father's side. He's a seed of Abraham on his mother's side. But before Abraham on his father's side. He got tired on his mother's side. But gave us rest on his father's side. He's Theanthropos. So much man that he fell asleep in a boat. But so much God that he got up and said, peace be still. So much man, so much man that he was annoyed when his mother was nugging him at Canaan feast. But so much God that he used water and turned to wine. So much man that he fell compassionate for 5,000 beside women and children. But so much God that he used a little boy lunch and fed five. Five uh, thousand, uh, uh, five thousand men uh, beside women and children. Uh, can I tell you uh, so much man uh, that he cried when his friend Lazarus died? Uh, so much man uh, that he wept. Uh, so much man uh, that he wept. Uh, the Jamaican, uh, the J the Jamaican translation says uh, so much. The Jamaican translator translator translation says uh, that he put on a piece of balling. Uh, he cried. But so much God uh, that he turned up four days later and the church was crying four days later but he said to Martha show me where you have laid him show me where you have laid him if you just show me where you have laid him if you just show me I will do something when Jesus got there he said Lazarus Lazarus Come forward, and the man who was dead four days got up. The arteries got back together, the bones got back together. He walked out, and that's why Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, for we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, or death. Where is thy sin? Oh grave, where is thy victory? But John, I said John, messes somebody up. John says in Revelation 21 and verse 6, Blessed, Macarius, happy are those who are part in the first resurrection, for the second shall have no power, but a, a divine being, an elder, had the divine audacity to ask a question in Revelation chapter 7, who 
are these? Who are these that have been arrayed in white robes? He had the divine audacity to ask the question. He's a divine being. We can't judge him. But he asks a good question. Who are these that have been arrayed in white robes? But John said, don't know it. These are they. These are they who have gone through great tribulation, but they have washed, they have washed, they stopped to be washed while others were playing. They were washing while others were criticizing. They were washing while others were downsizing. They were washing. The songwriter says what? What can wash away my sins? Nothing. Oh, John the Revelator says, I can't stop at chapter 7. John says, I can't stop. I know my time is up. John says, I can't stop at chapter 7. John says something else. I saw a new heaven. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first and the first earth were passed away and I John I John saw the holy city new Jerusalem coming down descending coming down out of heaven but he ain't finished yet because somebody's asking that in Genesis, we were separated from God. Somebody's asking that we had some pain in Genesis. Somebody's asking about what about, somebody's asking about the sorrows in Genesis. John says, there shall be no more crying. No more tears. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more heartaches. No more back aches. No more going to the hospital. Because our king will descend. And the saints of God will mount up just over. On the other side lies a city built by God's own hand. Oh, I hear him 632. I can see. When I pause to remember, a heartache here is but a stepping stone along the trail that wind in all ways of word. This troubled world, this troubled world is not my final home. But one day, free at last, 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 free at last. Just for even 30 seconds, we will ask you just to pray that very, very special prayer that no one else can pray but you. You just talk to God just for 30 seconds about you because we truly want to be emptied so that he can fill us with his Holy Spirit. Just for 30 seconds, pray that very, very silent prayer to your God.
ask him to empty you so that his Holy Spirit can fill you. Turn with me to hymn number 430. Oh, there'll be joy when the work is done. Joy when the reapers gather home, bringing the sheaves at set of sun to the new Jerusalem. Oh, there'll be joy when the work is done. Joy when Joy, 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 Sweet are the songs that we hope to sing. Sweet are the songs. Grateful the thanks our hearts shall bring. Praising forever Christ our King in the new Jerusalem. Let me hear you blend your voices and sing. Oh, Joys that await us there, all the joys that await us. Many the golden mansions fear. Jesus Himself doth them prepare. I can't hear you. Joy, joy. We thank you today that indeed our cups were emptied. We thank you that you have filled our cup. And those cups that were not emptied, they were knocked over. They were emptied finally because you have washed us today. You have scoured us today. Your Holy Spirit has stripped us today. And there's nothing left, Father. We come empty and broken. But we are thankful that our bigger brother, Jesus, is there. And with him we can have the power that we need. We can have the Holy Spirit transforming our lives. So that on that day we can hail you as King and Lord of our lives. We thank you for Pentecost this morning. We thank you for the spoken words. We thank you for the anointing upon your manservant. And we pray that you'll continue to bless his ministry, bless his family members, be with his dear wife and child. We pray that he will grow in the virtue and the stature and the knowledge of Jesus. And as you hold this family together, we pray that the enemy will be defeated in all his attempt. We thank you, Lord, for every soul today. We thank you for the watering of the words. And we continue to ask that you take CJC from strength to strength. Be with all of us, Father, and keep us in an attitude of prayer and thanksgiving, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. Let me take this opportunity to say thanks to those who shared in this very, very special devotional exercise. 
let me say thanks uh, to Sister Jackie Bennett, uh, Sister Malcolm, uh, Sister Patricia Gay, also Elder Myers, and of course, we give God thanks for our preacher. Amen. God bless you folks. We are indeed uh, poised for greater things as we transition into the remaining uh, segment and activities of the day. At this time, I will invite our personal ministers, director, Sabbath school director, Pastor Barrington McLean, who will give further instructions. God be praised, brethren. Let us continue to meditate on these things. Amen, friends. We were brought to heavenly places. What do you say? I have in my hand uh, a spectacle. Is that what you call it? Glasses? Uh, anybody who has lost his or her glasses, please see me in that room. We should have been taking a break right now, but in the interest of time, we have lost. That was a beautiful presentation, and I trust that your hearts were blessed. Joining us now is Pastor Marty Vargas, and he's standing in the wings. He'll be making a presentation with us shortly. Pastor Vargas has been with us from Tuesday, and we're delighted that he's here in Central Jamaica Conference. Pastor Vargas, what has your experience been so far? It's been such a beautiful, loving experience here. The people are so sweet. And more than that, God's presence. You can sense God's presence on a continuum here, and I praise his name for that. What can we expect to get from you? I mean, the previous sessions were about prayer focus and we were concentrated on having, doing other. Uh, what, what it is that we'll, can we expect to hear from you for these presentations? Well, we're going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit and we're also going to be enabled in order to witness for him and actually have practical principles to teach us how really to reach people. Okay, what does the expression a taste of Pentecost means to you? It means just the beginning. If it's this great now, can you imagine what it will be? Okay. And tell us one in one special presentation. It's the presentation that you're going to be making now. What is it what is it geared about? Evangelism for who? Just as particular per set of persons are for everyone. Yeah, it's for everyone. But it's more evangelism for outreach rather than in reach. But in the in-reach, we're going to be transformed in order to reach out. Thank you, Pastor Vargas, and all the best as you make your presentation. Thank you. That's it for the morning manner, but as you just heard, Pastor Vargas is going to make his presentation on evangelism now, so we invite you to stay tuned and be blessed.